Good morning. I, I have a tough job here this morning because, as Adrian has said, I know that some of you are very familiar with my work. You've watched everything I've done, and uh, so I'm probably going to bore, bore you to tears. And others, uh, perhaps, have never seen anything about this electric sun thing. And for them, uh, it's easy to deliver a complete snow job, and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to try to take you through an introduction, son of uh, the Electric Sun 101, and uh, well, we'll see how far we get. I hope that uh, I'm able to convince you of certain things. You can never prove anything in science, because tomorrow morning you can get new data and it'll disprove everything you said yesterday. But you can make some strong supporting evidence. And if you can come up with strong supporting evidence for what you are trying to present, and then get more supporting evidence to support that evidence, the wall begins to get higher and tougher to, to break down. Can't prove it, but you can get close. Anyway, we all know what that is. Uh, that's a picture that was taken about 11 months ago uh, during our last EU conference. This was taken from, uh, I think, Idaho or Oregon, because the path of totality went right across the states, and it started up there in the northwest. That little spot there in the in the lower left, uh, that's not an anomaly. That's the star Regulus in Leo. This is a fine uh, image. You look at that and, and you say, what is that? Well, of course, that's the sun. Well, is there a corona? Yes, that fuzzy stuff is, is certainly the corona. And if you look at it a little more intensely and carefully and try to be analytical about what you're looking at, you realize that it doesn't. the corona doesn't spray out isotropically, like the fingers of your hand, or like the Japanese Navy battle flag, if you remember what that looked like. But rather, these rays, some of them, come together. They form uh, almost a triangular shape. Um, uh, they're called coronal caps. Some do diverge, like the Japanese battle flag, but these others come together and form those caps. Why? The classical astronomy has no answer for that. The electric star model does. And several other uh, things that the, uh, the electric star model can explain. So I'd like to go and present a few of those. You can see those are, again, these, uh, this coming together process is, that's called a coronal cap. And so if you Google coronal caps, there's another one out here, obviously. Another one here. Why, why do they happen? What are they? Well, first of all, the whole corona, of course, is, is plasma. It's positive and negative charges out there floating around in space. Um, the classical astronomy view is the sun is a, is a, a stove. It, it doesn't burn wood. It burns hydrogen. Hydrogen converts it into helium, but it's still a stove. Now, I, have a, I had at least a, a wood stove in my previous home. It never radiated any electrons that I could find. Um, you look at a candle, that doesn't radiate electrons either. So something's very different about this animal than the classical astronomy model would, uh, would have you believe. Uh, of course, the question is, if it is electrical, where does the electricity come from? Everybody always says, well, we, we, okay, you're talking about these electrons. Where do they get in? Well, there was you know, past several flights of uh, the SOHO, uh, uh, pa several passes of the SOHO satellite uh, came up with documents that, with pictures, drawings that look like that, that it is becoming clear that the surroundings of the sun are very different near its poles. And that's, we think, where the electrical input path is. We're not sure, because we, SOHO, none of, the, none of the, uh, the probes have ever been able to get right over the top of the sun. We'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, one of the things we have to clean up right away, I think, is this idea of electricity versus gravity. And some people have said, uh, we had a, a representative from Scientific American, and he said, well, you're just trying to tell me that gravity doesn't exist out there, it's all electricity? No, that's not what we're saying at all. And what Wall is saying is that electricity and gravity are really the same thing. Gravity is an electrical phenomenon. 
So uh, nobody in the EU says that electricity replaces gravity. It moves it out and it moves in. No. What is true is that the electrical forces between two electrons is roughly 10 to the 36th power. That's a number one followed by 36 zeros. That's even bigger than the national debt. <laughs> that number is how much stronger the electric force is than the gravitational force between oh, two similar particles like a positive, uh, positron and a, um, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, yeah, a positive nucleus and, and an electron. Um, there, anyway, let's see. Uh, there we go. Yeah, gravity is always present, but when electric forces are also present, we can usually ignore gravity. And it's just that simple. Gravity never goes away. It's there, always. But uh, it can be relatively unimportant. So that, for example, uh, you don't have to put your coffee maker, plug it into the wall, at a higher point on the wall than the coffee maker is so that gravity can pull the electrons down. You can plug that thing down two stories down and it'll still heat the coffee. Has gravity now been displaced? No, it's still there. So that's the thought I want to get across, that everything is still there, except at times electric forces can be shielded. So you can build yourself a, a copper room and gravity can't be shielded. Gravity will go right through into anything, into a cave, into a copper room, any place. Build a copper room and the electric field won't get in there. So there's a couple of advantages of E, e and M, electricity and magnetism. One is they both can attract and repel, and gravity can only attract. And you've got electric forces and you've got magnetic forces and each of those can both attract and repel. So you've got four times the possible mechanisms in the electric universe than you do just, if you say nothing there but gravity. How do you make things repel each other with gravity? Well, there's all sorts of, well, they hit together and then rebound. No, well, I don't think so. Anyway, let's get to business. I want to tell you about the sun as much as I can in the 45 minutes that I have. Um, there are three major layers of the sun's surface. And right, right off the bat, that's wrong. There is no such thing as a surface. But there are certain layers. And one of them, the so-called uh, photosphere, which is the yellow at the bottom, of course, uh, is, is not transparent. It's not even translucent. It's, you can't see through it. So people think of the top of the photosphere as being the surface of the sun. Well, it isn't really, but visually it is. So these three layers, the corona, the chromosphere, and the photosphere are the things I'd like to talk at least briefly about. And where the action is, is in the, uh, in the photosphere. And um, I'd like to talk to, about it, to you about some of the things that we see and how those, we model those three layers to explain some of these things that we see. This is the so-called temperature inversion problem. Um, people, there's all sorts of names that have been given to it. But uh, what that plot is, of course, is just a plot of uh, distance out is the horizontal axis. So this, this, this right here, zero, is really uh, taken as the bottom of the photosphere. So you come up through the photosphere, that's about a thousand kilometers, and up through the chromosphere and up beyond into the corona. And the temperature goes wacko. It starts to decrease just like from your wood stove, just like as you back away from the radiator. It reaches a minimum, but then strangely begins to rise slightly through the chromosphere and then goes up here to something like two million Kelvin. That's hot. Well, what, what do you mean temperature? Temperature is a measure of excitation, random motion. So if the plasma is relatively quiescent, we say the temperature is low. And you can talk about the, the uh, positive ion temperature 
in a plasma as being different from the electron temperature in a plasma? Sure, sure, why not? Because the protons are about 1,800 times heavier than the electron, and so they're tougher to move. The electrons can move around, so it's very typical to have electron temperatures that are two or three times the, the temperature of the protons in exactly the same plasma, in exactly the same area. But the question is, what makes this thing go bananas like that? And uh, all sorts of uh, theories have, have been put forward. Uh, in, in my mind, in any rational ag analysis, they don't work. Uh, and the, still the question is, why? I'll try to answer that in a minute. The solar wind is another one that uh, is a problem. The solar wind is a flow of charged plasma particles coming outward from the sun. And it speeds up to about a million miles an hour. That is about 800 kilometers per second as it passes by Earth. And um, it pumps energy into the Earth's radiation belts. And uh, as Wall pointed out, that both of our heroes, uh, one hero of both of us, I should say, is Christian Birkeland. And he discovered this and or postulated at least the existence of this flow of charge, which of course a flow of charge is a current, a current from the sun that would pop, uh, would power the uh, aurora. We now know that it does it doesn't just do it to Earth; it does it to Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. And I think lately, it was the last week, one of the moons of Jupiter or Triton, which is that of Jupiter or Saturn, but some of the some of the bigger moons also have auroras, and so they get powered from the same source, the sun, flows of charges from the sun. And the solar wind comes in two different varieties. That's not well known by the public, but it's true. There's a fast solar wind and a slow solar wind. And they come from different locations, different places. And of course, the big question is, why? I think the electric sun, I'm convinced the electric sun model will give the answer to that question. Anyway, to, to get down to business here, before my 45 goes out, uh, the classical plasma discharge has been studied for decades in the electronic uh, plasma laboratory. This, I won't go into detail about these plots, but obviously what happens, or I think it's obvious, you take a glass tube and you stick a, a, an anode, or that is to say a cathode, uh, or anode pair in here, the, these two uh, pieces of metal are hooked to wires that go out through the glass tube. You hook, you evacuate the tube, let a little bit of gas of some sort in. The classics, classical experiments, that was always a, um, a, a, one of the um, unreactive noble gases, uh, xenon, neon, that sort of thing, because they didn't want to get any chemical effects that they couldn't explain. So they had something that was inert. And then look and see what, the, what dynamics happened. And so they looked and they found, when you put a positive voltage on here and a negative voltage on here, what happens? Well, electrons come up the wire. Everybody should realize, nothing flows in a wire except electrons. You can't, no, no positive ions flow in a wire. So what the early days, all, all the attention was put on the cathode. How are we going to make a piece of metal such that if we put a voltage between the cathode and the anode, positive over here and negative over here, we can get the electrons to jump out of the metal into the chamber? That's a, that's a trick. How do you get an electron to jump out of the wire? And they were able to do that by various tricks, like putting filaments and heating up the cathode and also making the cathode out of thoriated tungsten and a few, a few other things. But eventually what they did was they found that typically you get this sort of structure. There was a, a, a rather bright glow next to the anode called uh, unimaginative, unimaginatively the anode glow. And we got the positive column, which was a, a, a form of plasma very much like the, oh, the typical neon sign, you know, eat at Joe's, the, the stuff that's inside that's, that's plasma in the so-called glow mode. 
And then out here near the cathode, there was some other stuff. We're not too much concerned right now with this because the, what we have used, we've adopted uh, the idea that Ralph Juergens came up with, and he's an engineer, 1970, said that this is the way the sun works. And the, the anode glow that we see here are anode tufts that appear on the anode, and that's what the, the photosphere of the sun consists of. Well, that's a, that's a leap, but let's see if it if it makes sense. Um, let's see. The, uh, the, uh, the I, I guess I should probably say that there are three kinds of plasma, uh, three not kinds, but three different modes that plasma can take on: dark mode, glow mode, and arc mode. Arc mode, everybody knows, that's lightning. When you scuff your feet across the floor and touch the doorknob, you'll actually see the spark. That's, that's actually arc mode plasma. Uh, the, the positive column, the glow mode, that's the Edith Joes, that's the fluorescent signs. The dark mode, is, there's nothing mysterious about the dark mode. The ionosphere of Earth is dark mode. I used to have a ham radio operator's license and I could bounce my signal off of the ionosphere, the F2 layer, and I could talk from America to England, and I did so. That radio signal, if there were no ionosphere there, would just simply go out in space and nobody in England would hear me. So clearly it's there. Uh, it, it is also obviously there when it switches into the glow mode, and that's what we call the aurora. So, uh, there are these three different modes of uh, plasma. Let me get just a slightly bit technical, and uh, I hope to make this clear to you. This is a plot of, think of yourself in that tube. You're at a point in the tube. At any point in that tube, there are two operative quantities that, you can, that are important. One is at that point, there's a force, an electrical field, an E field measured in volts per meter, which is the vertical axis, is the force on every unit plus charge in that, wherever it may be in the plasma. The horizontal axis is the other variable, and that's at that same exact point, what is the current density? A current density, that's how many amperes per square area. Think of it as, uh, Think of a cross-section of a flow of a river, and you're thinking about a certain liter of water coming down the river. And if there's lots of water per square meter of the cross-section, then there's a, that's an indication of the flow. You've got to multiply that by how many square meters there are, and then you have the total flow of the river. So the current density is measured along the horizontal axis. And you can see, this is not moving from one place to another in the plasma. This is how one single immovable, immo unmoving point can vary the force on it and the, the current density on it. And what's interesting, and this is a long-winded way of saying it, is some of these, like from this point F to that point G, and from this point H to that point J, the slope is negative. Well, if you were to plot this same plot for a resistor, a resistor would go a straight line that begins at the origin and just go straight up. If it were a high-valued resistor, lots of ohms, that says it takes lots of voltage, lots of E-field to get just a little bit of current to flow. So that a high resistance would have a very steep curve. A low resistor would have a slopey curve like that. And so the... The point is, well, so what? What does this negative slope mean? It's called negative dynamic resistance. That says that if I'm at a point that's operating somewhere around right in there, I, the charge, can reduce the force that I'm experiencing by increasing the current density. In other words, the point isn't gonna move. The point's right there, but at that same point, if we can change the, uh, my shaky hand here, the, the, the E field, the electric force on it, from this point down to say this much, we've decreased the E field, and we do that 
at the cost of increasing from here to here the current density. Think of that yourself. How do you increase the current density at a point in a plasma? You reduce the, the square area through which the current's flowing. In other words, the plasma naturally of itself, in order to, if I push on it, it'll shrink back. It shrinks back by forming filaments. So the, the places on this plot like that have negative slope are places where plasma naturally tends to form filaments. This one we all know about. That's the lightning bolt. <laughs> there's, if there's arc mode plasma. You can see it down there, JDK, which looks like a sheet uh, in the old-fashioned movie projector projection devices. They would they'd put two electrodes together and pull them apart, and there would be a, a sheet of flame, really. That's a sheet of arc mode plasma. Not an arc. But when the, when the current density is at the low range of the arc mode, arcs tend to form. Over here, when you're at the low current density range of glow mode, filaments tend to form. That's the coronal caps. If you think of yourself, where do those coronal caps form? They form at the outer edge of the corona. That's the low current density position in close to the sun. There's lot, lots of it's a higher density because you know, there's a spherical geometry. So if you're close to the sun, the, the area through which your current is passing is much smaller. So as you go out to the end of the corona, the current density gets lower. And so going outward from the sun is coming this way, sort of from right to left on that diagram. And so that's why along in here, right at the outer edge of the corona, before the corona shuts off, before it goes beyond that, it's dark mode. It's on its way to Earth, Mercury at least. So there's an electrical reason for the existence of those, those coronal caps. That's easy. Astronomers, how come you didn't figure that one out? Because it exists, electricity doesn't, doesn't exist. And if it does, it doesn't do anything. Yes, it does. Anyway, here's the, the picture of the photosphere. And those are the granules that uh, the astronomers call photospheric granules, like sand grains. They're not, they're photospheric tufts. That's a movie, can you see it going? Can you see it moving? Focus on any one of those guys. And you can see them getting bigger, brighter, and then shrinking away to zero. You see it? So that's another question. Why do these little globs of arc mode plasma, the so-called plasma tufts, the anode tufts, why do they grow and what, what, what kills them? Why don't they just stay there forever? Next slide. Well, one of the next, one of the upcoming slides. Anyway, it's plasma in the arc mode, and they come and go with time. Oh, the temperature, by the way, is about about six thousand Kelvin. Uh, that's the temperature of one of the the top the tops of those tufts, the the, the real intense uh, plasma. Arc mode plasma. Here's the guts of Jurgen's electric sun model. Let me see if I can get you through it intuitively. The top graph is a graph of the voltage, like you would measure with a voltmeter. Uh, if you come this point here, this is distance out, away from, radially out from the sun. So this point here is zero radius. Well, it doesn't mean the center of the sun. It means just below one of those plasma tufts. The, what should we call it? The apparent surface of the sun, if you will. And if, so if you measure the voltage as you come out, this is one of these plasma tufts. You come up through, uh, as you come up from the bottom of the sun into the bottom of the tuft, the voltage goes up. Then it's pretty constant as you come up through the tuft. And as you break out of the top of the tuft, 
all of a sudden the voltage goes down. The analogy to this, if you don't want to think about voltage and current and electricity, think about uh, the cross section of a, of a hill. This is really the potential energy. Voltage is indeed potential energy. Uh, but if you want to think of a bowling ball on a hill or a hockey puck on top of a frozen ice rink up on the top here, uh, this, I, these hockey pucks can go around and maybe hit each other. The random motion of the temperature of them will maybe cause one or two to ricochet off and maybe one might come out here to a point closer to the surface than A, what will happen to it? It falls off the hill. Uh, if a hockey puck gets out to the right of point B, down the hill it goes. Well, that's what happens to the positive ions. And if you think of the interior of the sun as being a huge reservoir of positive ions, uh, they are hitting it to each other, They're all, they want to get out. Well, they need to have enough energy to get up to the top of the hill. If they just go bang and bang and back and back and forth in here, they don't get out. But if they come up high enough to just make that, then they can go gliding across the top of the voltage hill. Or you can think of it as a reservoir. This is a dam at the end of the reservoir. And if the water is high enough in the reservoir, it can just slick over the top of the, of the dam and then go down the chromosphere. That's a hill. And if that happens, think of the water analogy. What happens is that this is like a water slide. Not only in an amusement park, but really in hydraulic laboratories, they have water slides and they study the hydraulics of what water flow, what, what happens. The water on a water slide becomes almost transparent. In fact, there's, a, there's some really nice uh, things you can hang on your wall if you want to buy one of these units. And it's a, it, they're very, very beautiful, actually. They, they hang it on the wall, and you can see the water come down. And it's almost like a piece of glass. You can put your finger on it, and you can see that it is water flow. Uh, but if, without disrupting it, it looks transparent. In other words, there is not much random motion in there. So the temperature here is lower than it is up here, and then certainly than it is down here, because what happens down here at the bottom of a water slide? Foam! Because the water is colliding with other water that's in, in the lake or whatever it is down here. So you get this, this that's what this bottom picture shows. This is the, the uh, velocity of one of these particles. And this region is a region of turbulence. Uh, the, the force, the electric field, is the, are the black curves here. So if, if, you, if you were an ion here, uh, you would be, uh, the force would be pushing you in, back into the sun, right? So yeah, the electric field, the magnitude of it is negative. Or I should say the sign of it is negative. It's a negative force, a negative force in the negative direction. Whereas out here, on the ski jump or the water slide, the force is positive, and actually the maximum force that, it, that the particle will experience is, of course, the point of maximum downward slope. So the E field, for those of you who have had any calculus at all, the, uh, the electric field is the negative gradient of the voltage. It's the negative of the slope. So here's the negative slope. So the negative of a negative slope is positive. So that's why the E field is positive. One last thing about, well, two things about this slide. These areas here, the, the plus and the minus, one of Maxwell's equations, and which I will not bother you with, uh, says that if you have a region where the slope of the E field is positive, that will be a region of plus charge. If you have a region where the slope of the electric field is negative, it's downward slope of the E field. It doesn't make any difference whether the E field itself is positive or negative. It's the slope that counts. If the slope is negative, it's a region of negative charge. And you look at these two things, and you say, hey, that's a bunch of positive charges and a bunch of negative charges right next to each other. That's what we call a double layer. So, says the astronomer, they, why, that can't exist in, in, in steady state. That po those positive charges and negative charges will attract each other and cancel each other out, and it's all gone. 
How can you say that that stays there? That's the reason that Irving Langmuir got the Nobel Prize in 1930. He came up with the, the requirements for a, a double layer like this one to exist. And very non-mathematically, it requires a certain amount of protons going one way and electrons coming the other way. And if you stop to think about this, think about the, the tube with the cathode over on the right and the anode on the left, that's exactly what's going on in a plasma. The anode is where the positive ions are formed. The electrons are coming in from the, from the right. And yes, indeed. So Irving Langmuir would be very happy with that. And indeed, that's how a double layer is sustained. And so it's all explained very easily. But, and of course, the, the, what does this turbulence mean? That's the two million Kelvin. That diagram completely explains the uh, temperature anomaly, so-called. Because this is the region of laminar flow where the temperature is lowest. That's the minimum of the temperature. And out here, where all the collisions are going on, that's and it's exactly where it happens is in the lower corona. So this diagram I submit to you uh, explains that problem completely. So just quickly, the, the electric sun model explains why the corona exists in the first place. It's an electronic discharge of positive ions and incoming electrons. Uh, the temperature profile is explained. Oh, the spicules, I didn't talk about them, but in the chromosphere there are these fountains of, that they observe. Uh, the electric sun model s explains what they are. Mostly the standard models just sort of says, yeah, it's there, but we don't know what it is and we don't care. Well, we do care. That those spicules are fountains of electrons that supply the excessive amount of electrons that are needed out to the right of the double layer in order to support it, in order to obey the requirement that Irving Langmuir came up with and for which he was awarded the, the uh, Nobel. Um, Let's see, what else have I got here? Oh, this photospheric tufts limit the outward flow of the positive ions leaving the sun. Okay, well, here's a sort of a, I think, a, a simpler diagram. And if you understand this, you got it. The purple is, think of it as water. This is a, a dam. This, the purple is the water and a reservoir in back of the dam. And we have a situation here where the height of the reservoir is just a little bit higher than the, than the height of the dam. So water will trickle over the top of the dam and down. Let me suggest two things to you. In a flow, like what you would measure out here, and these particles, of course, become the solar wind. They're, they escape. Uh, if you measure the flow here, you can measure really two main quantities. One is, what's the velocity of the flow? And the second thing would be, what's the density of the flow? How many cubic meters per second do I get out of the, coming out of this thing? There are two different quantities, and they are de those numbers, the quantities themselves, are determined by two different things. The speed, the velocity of the flow, is controlled by the height of the dam, the height through which the particles flow. If this were the bowling ball on top of a mountain, up here, it's just sitting there, it doesn't have any kinetic energy, but it's got a lot of potential energy. It's on the top of the hill, whatever it is. But then when it comes down here, it pays out, it, it, um, it changes, it exchanges his, its, its uh, potential energy, which it has up here, for kinetic energy, which is 1 half mv squared, which says, that tells you how fast it's going. So the height of the hill, the height of the dam, you know, what we are concerned with, the height of the voltage of the photospheric tuft is what controls the velocity coming out the bottom. The density of the flow, however, depends on how thick that layer is. The density doesn't, isn't determined by how, how far the water flows and falls after it gets over the dam. The density of the flow is controlled by how, how much higher is this level than 
than the, than the level it has to get over. So, um, well, okay, I, I'll come back to that in a second, but my next slide is of the solar wind. That's a very interesting diagram, but it's mostly eyewash. Uh, forget the picture of the sun, it's pretty, but it doesn't mean anything right there. It's just, it shows you where the sun is. And what this is a graph of, is this graph is a, is a plot of speed, velocity. And the distance you are from the center, the direction doesn't matter, okay? So this is 1,000 kilometers per second. This is 1,000 kilometers per second, 1,000 kilometers per second in different directions, but that's how fast the stuff is going. This is a measure of the speed of the so-called solar wind. And you can see that if you are in the upper or the lower hemisphere, not at the, not at the, not at the equatorial range, but if you're up in, in an angle, say, between 20 and 85, or minus 20 and minus 85, the maximum speed of the solar wind is about 850 kilometers per second. That's moving. That's the so-called fast solar wind. However, if you're at, in, the, uh, in the equatorial zone here of the sun, the maximum sp speed is about half of that. So it's about, when it does get up to maximum, the maximum is about 400 kilometers per second. Well, oh, by the way, this swoops stands for Solar Wind Observatory Over the Poles of the Sun. And you notice they didn't complete the diagram here. They didn't, they didn't have enough data to complete the diagram here. Why? Because they never got over the, sol over the pole of the sun. This solar probe, this is the Ulysses probe, did get up to about 85 degrees, but it never got into what we think is that downward, inward coming current stream. And maybe they did a little bit and they got such anomalous data that they just left it out, I don't know. But uh, this is, again, it's not confirmation of anything, but this is, the, this is what happens, this is what, is what we know happens in the solar wind. Um, sorry. So anyway, um, the properties of the fast solar wind. It emanates from regions of the sun's surface where there are no sunspots, generally. Sunspots are pretty much in that equatorial zone. It's not that they can't drift out, they do once in a while. But generally they're in that, somewhere around in the, in the oh, plus 20 to minus 20 degrees range. Uh, and it, it comes out, the solar wind does, comes out through the tops of the photospheric tufts. It comes over the top of the dam. It, Sounds reasonable. Uh, it approaches 800 kilometers per second at a distance, approximately nine radii, and it accelerates. The farther out it goes, the faster it goes. That's not the way an explosion works. You set off a bomb right near where the explosion occurs, the velocity is maximum, and it gets slower and slower and slower. This is the reverse. It gets faster and faster and faster. What does that suggest to you, even a, even a non-engineer? You've got an electric field which exists out there because the sun has a positive charge and that electric field is accelerating those particles. Well, anyway, if I'm going to get through this talk and there's a lot of time, I've got to sort of speed up a little bit. Here's a, there's the example of the water coming over the top of the dam. Uh, here is a, sort of a picture uh, of a schematic diagram of the way you can think about it, if, if you have the, a floodgate, which you can raise and lower hydraulically, you can control the, uh, the volume of the, of the flow. The velocity of the flow is controlled not by where this is, but how high the dam is. Follow what I'm saying? The, the velocity that you get when you come out the bottom is a, is a function of how far you've fallen. But the amount, gallons per second, cubic meters per second, is determined by how thick that flow is right there. The difference between the top of the floodgate and the, uh, the um, height of the water in, in back of the reservoir. Anybody knows about electronics, you know about the Fermi level of the, of the positive ions in back in here. 
So, um, so there again, that same diagram, a little bit more complicated. For anybody who has any electrical engineering or electronics background, this operates just like a, a, a bipolar uh, PNP transistor with the emitter, base, and collector of the transistor being here. For those of you who don't ever heard of it, haven't heard of a transistor, forget it. But uh, th there's, a, there's a really neat analogy between how a transistor works and this. And again, this is the whole idea that the, the height of the, the dam controls the speed of the flow. And of course, the, uh, in I think it was 2009, the solar wind just shut off for two days. Now, what mechanism could do that? Well, you raise the, the floodgate and stop it. And just like turning off a tap, if you try to stop a flow of water into your kitchen sink by putting your hand against it, you're going to get wet. But if you just turn the knob, it just shuts it off beautifully. So a very small fluctuation of one thing controls a big, heavy flow in, an, in another thing. And this is the way this thing works. If the tufts are not present, however, then nothing stops charge carriers from the interior of the sun going out into the, into the corona. So if somebody blows a hole in the dam, uh, then the picture, of course, is that the dam is no longer there. So what happens? Well, water from back here from the typical en energy level of the sun is free to just go out. So what kind of a flow would you expect? If you think about it, what you would expect is the volume of the flow would vastly increase. There's no control. It just blow a hole in the dam and <laughs> Mabel bar the door, here she comes. But the velocity of the flow is not as great because it didn't have to get up over the top of this hill and fall this whole distance. It only falls from this distance. So that, I claim, is how the low velocity, high volume flow, slow solar wind works. So there is a picture of the tremendous uh, amount of turbulence, a tremendous amount of, in our case, the temperature. So. The slow solar wind emanates from the equatorial region of the sun where there's sunspots. The maximum velocity is only about 400 kilometers. Uh, I want to speed up here. But there is essentially what happens. And so you can think of, uh, if, if this, the, the dam is here, closer to the observer, and then if you go into the plot, let's say you get to a place where there, the dam has disappeared, and you get this kind of flow so this, the red dotted line, is, it describes the, the voltage curve that the slow solar wind takes. There's a lot more of it, but it doesn't fall from quite as high, so it goes slower. So next to, if you were on the, on the sun, and this is also a movie if you look at it, the yellow uh, around the periphery, those are the normal solar tufts, the anode tufts. That's the origin of the fast solar wind. But if you realize that right next to any of these guys, there's this umbra, that's a place where somebody blew up the dam and removed all the, all the solar tufts, then uh, that says that the, the, the particles here, the, the tufts, can fall into, that is down, and in that previous plot they fall to the left, fall down to the surface of the sun, which is this black area here, surface, uh, what we call the surface. And then from there, there's, they look up and there's nothing there but blue sky, so whoosh, here we go. So the slow solar wind is emanating from the umbra of the sunspots. Um, the most important thing about this diagram, and this is one of the most important diagrams I think that I'd like to present to you, is if you observe very critically a, a positive tuft, one of these yellow guys, 
that's right next to where the, uh, the ones that are going to fall in, in, in this deep, deep red color. The, some of these, these photospheric tufts are falling inward. See them? There they go. There they go. They're all falling inward. But right at the juncture between what falls in and what stays up, the yellow ones, the ones that stay up on the normal photosphere, they're moving away from the sunspot, not toward it. I submit that this is prima facie proof, if you can use that word proof, that this phenomenon is not solely gravitational. Because what's happening when these yellow ones are moving away from the sunspot and the red ones are moving toward the sunspot is they're all positive charges, so they don't like each other, so they push each other. And if I push you and you push me, we push each other away from each other. And that's what's happening here, a mutual repulsion. And the only reason it doesn't happen out here in the normal range of these, these uh, photospheric tufts is because the, uh, the opportunity for these guys falling away into freedom doesn't exist out here in the normal photosphere. Anyway, I, that's my 45 minutes. Uh, i just show you that's, that's a, a gravitational analogy, um, that, an iceberg calving off of a glacier. Uh, but this guy is not pushing back on this so that this guy moves away. This next, what should I say, neo, neo iceberg or whatever he is, uh, he's not going to move. He's completely dumb, unaware of anything going on with this guy. But if these were both positively charged, this one, even as it's falling away to the right, will still be pushing back on this guy, and he'll move to the left if he can. And that's what we see in the sun. So therefore, I submit to you that that is absolute, well, close enough to absolute proof that I'll call it proof, strong supportive evidence that this is an electrical process. Anyway, uh, that's my 45 minutes. I had other things to tell you, tell you about, but we can uh, do that over a glass of wine in the, <laughs> in the bar some night. Um, and I will be, will be back tomorrow, I hope to bore you further, but this time not with the sun, but with what happens to that solar wind when it, uh, when it leaves the sun. We talk about Berkeley currents at that point. Anyway, I'll quit at that point. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>